Hi and welcome to another story and today we have part six of Lola Rose by Jacqueline Wilson continuing from chapter 15 Voice of Doom. The letter came from the hospital. It was the first letter we'd had at our new address. Mum tore open the envelope, her hand shaking so badly she tore the letter too. She held a half in either hand helplessly. Oh God, this is it kids, she said. I'm going in on Thursday, this Thursday. They don't give you much notice. Still, Mr Key said he'd slot me in as soon as possible. Mum smiled as if Mr Key was keen to make a date with her. I don't want you to go into hospital, Mum, said Kendall. Not Thursday. You take me swimming on Thursdays. You can't go. I have to go, little mate, said Mum. But she didn't seem so sure on Wednesday night. She started drinking. I got scared she'd make herself sick again. You can't get drunk, Mum, not when you're going into hospital tomorrow, I said, trying to sneak the bottle away. You put that right back, Lola Rose. In fact, you can pour me another glass. But Mum, I poured her the tiniest measure. Then I deliberately dropped the bottle. It made a horrible mess on the carpet. I cut my fingers trying to clear it up. Mum slapped me hard for being so clumsy. I cried. Then Mum cried too. We had a long mournful cuddle. I carried Kendall into Mum's bed and we all huddled up together. I don't think Mum slept. She was wide awake whenever I woke up. I kept having nightmares. George's chlorine smell made me dream we were all in the water, clinging to each other as we sank down and down where the sharks were waiting. We got up very early. Mum had bought us croissants and Danish pastries as a treat for breakfast. She didn't need to bite herself. Kendall picked out all the currants, licked the icing, but only ate a mouthful himself. I ate my way through three pa pastries, even though they'd gone a bit stale overnight. No matter how much I ate, I couldn't stop the huge empty feeling inside me. Mum wouldn't let us say goodbye properly. We won't make a thing of it, or we'll all start howling. Go on, kids, off to school. I've got a treat in the fridge for you for tea. You be good, a good boy for Lola Rose, Kendall, and go to bed when she says. I'll be home as soon as I can make it. Don't come to the hospital just in case anyone asks why you're on your own. Go on then, scram. Don't look so scared. I'll be fine, I promise you. I'm Lady Luck. I took Kendall to school, but then I came scurrying back home. Mum came rushing to the door at the sound of my key. Her face was pink with hope. I think she thought I was Jake. Lola Rose. I'll help you pack your bag for the hospital and see you off properly. Mum sighed, but she didn't have the energy to send me back to school. She got her ca case out. God, wasn't it weird throwing all our things together that night your dad went for you, she said. I wonder what he's doing now. He'll be getting drink, drunk, singing, chatting up girls, fighting. I opened Mum's chest of drawers, looking through her stuff. You don't think I should tell him, just in case. Mum stopped. I stopped too. No, but he is your dad. He does love you, darling. And there's Kendall. He was always so gentle with him. No! held up her best black nighty. You can't wear this, Mum. It's see-through, I said. No, it isn't, said Mum. Well, she put her hand up inside the flip filmy nylon. I suppose it is a bit. Still, maybe I'll give Mr Key one last sneaky peep at a perfect pair of boobs before he goes digging for lumps. Shut up, Mum, I said. It might look weird with bandages underneath, though, said Mum mournfully. Oh, God, maybe I'd better buy a new nighty on the way. She looked in her purse. Maybe not. I'm going to have to get my act together work-wise the minute I get out of hospital. I should have done something about it sooner, but I just wanted to be with you kids. That's what we wanted too, Mum. Look, what about my nightie? It's clean. Well, I've only worn it a couple of times. It would fit you easy peasy. It was a white t-shirt with a teddy bear on the front. Mum looked at it and then folded it into her case. OK, I'll take it. I'll look a bit daft, but I'll be decent. It'll be like I'm cuddled up with you, Lola Rose. I'll like that. Mum looked at me. You will be all right, won't you, lovey? Look, I'll leave you my mobile just in case of emergencies. Don't you run up a big, a big bill, though. There's a good girl. You won't mind being by yourselves tonight, will you? Of course not, I said quickly. It's not as if you're really alone in the house, Mum said. I mean, there's Miss Parker downstairs and the two boys up above. Yes, Mum, I said. We both knew poor, smelly Miss Parker couldn't look after herself, let alone anyone else. And Mum and Steve and Andy weren't on speaking terms anymore. Mum thought Steve was being overly friendly to Jake, told him to stop making eyes at her boyfriend. She said some other stuff too. Steve and Andy were mortally offended. Mum started biting the skin around her thumb. I gently took it out of her mouth. Quit that, Mum. We'll be fine. <laughs> you could always try to get hold of Jake, though his mobile switched off at the moment, the little what's it. Don't try to phone him, Mum. We don't need him. We don't need anyone. You're such a good grown-up girl, Lola Rose, said Mum. I tried hard to feel grown up. I made Mum a cup of tea and sat her down with a stale croissant while I packed her washing things and her hairbrush and her makeup. I slipped in a card at the bottom of her case. I'd made it for her. 
I'd cut out a sad-looking baby bunny and stuck it in the middle, with little bits of tissue stuck on its ears and paws to look like bandages. I'd wondered about a bandage across its chest, but decided that would be too liter literal. I surrounded him with flowers and butterflies and birds and wrote, Get well soon, Mum, with lots of love from Lola Rose and Kendall, in my best handwriting. Kendall had added lots of kisses. He didn't do them carefully, though. The kisses were all different sizes and spoiled the symmetry of the design, but I, but I hoped Mum wouldn't mind. I gave her my own kisses at the bus stop. I got a bit carried away. That's enough. You wipe all my powder off, said Mum. She looked at my watch. Oh, to hell with this. I'll go up the high street and get a minicab. But it's miles to the hospital, Mum. Look, I'm an invalid. Why should I have to bum around on buses, said Mum. So I went with her to the minicab firm. I kissed her again and gave her one last hug. And another. And another. And then she got in the car and they drove off. I waved long after the minicab had gone down the street and round the corner, out of sight. Then I stood there. I kept seeing Mum waving back from inside the car, sending herself up, doing one of those slow, spread-fingered, fancy waves like royalty as she mouthed goodbye. The terrible voice of doom spoke inside my head. What if this really is goodbye? What if this is the last time you ever see your Mum? I ran like mad to get out of earshot. I went into the HMV shop in the arcade, ramming on the headphones, turning the volume right up. My head started throbbing. It was only 11 o'clock, but I decided to go and get some lunch. Mum had given me £10, which seemed heaps. I had a burger and French fries and a large Coke. I crammed it down quickly and felt just as empty as when I'd finished. It seemed too mean to Kendall to spend much more on myself. So I sat there, where I was, watching a mum with two little kids across the way from me. The kids were just picking at their food. The moment they were wheeled off in their double buggy, I whizzed over to their table. They'd left half a burger, heaps of French fries, and most of a McFlurry ice cream. I stuffed them down so quickly I felt sick, even though I still felt empty. I mooched around the shops for a while, nibbling at a bar of Cadbury's. I meant to save half of it for Kendall, but I couldn't quite manage it. I didn't know what to do with myself. I didn't want to go back home in case it would feel too weird without Mum, even though I was used to her being out so a lot. So, like some sad little wimp, I scuttled back to school. At least I got another lunch. I told the teacher I'd had a tummy upset, but I was better now. Were you really sick? Harpreet whispered. She was trying to make friends with me again. I wanted to be her friend, but I was still mad at her. Yeah, I was sick because I was drunk like my mum, I whispered back. We split a whole bottle of, bottle of vodka. Harpreet's mouth opened in a big O. Oh, you never. Of course I never, I said. You're so thick sometimes, Harpreet. You'll believe anything. Then I relented. No, you're not thick. You're thin as a pin. I'm the one who's thick. Look. I punched my big tummy. Yuck. I'm getting so fat. Look. Harpreet giggled. Maybe you're pregnant, she said. We both laughed. It was okay now. We were friends again. I told her my mum had gone into hospital. You poor thing. You must be so worried. Yeah, well, obviously. She'll be all right, said Harpreet, patting my hand. So, who's looking after you and Kendall if Jake's done a runner? He hasn't. My mum got rid of him, I said. Well, whatever, Harpreet said. So who's coming? A granny? An auntie? I knew I shouldn't say, but I couldn't help wanting to show off. No one's looking after us, I said airily. Harpreet boggled at me in a satisfying manner. You can't manage by yourselves. Sure we can. It's only overnight. My mum would never let me stay by myself. She wouldn't even let my sister stay home by herself last holidays and she was 18. Don't tell your mum, I said hurriedly, scared there might be trouble. I won't. Promise? Yeah, I swear, said Harpreet, gesturing, sealing her lips and cutting her throat. Her forehead wrinkled as she thought it all out. Who will cook your tea, she said. I will. I often cook. It all depends what you mean by cook. I could open a tin and make toast. That was kind of cooking. I knew Harpreet was thinking of the complicated curries she had at home. You're so cool, Ola Rose, she said. It's like you're an adult already. She made me feel cool. But then I had to go home and face the empty, empty, empty flat. I want mum, said Kendall, sitting down in the middle of the floor, burying his nose in George's matted fur. Yes, but you know mum's in hospital. It's okay. You've still got me. I don't want you. I want mum, said Kendall, screwing up his face. Shut up, and don't you dare cry. I'm fed up with you being such a grizzle guts. Now listen, if you're good, I'll make you some tea. But if you're going to blub, I think you'll just, well, you're just a little baby and put a nappy on you and put you to bed. Kendall scowled at me. I don't like you. I don't like you either, I said. I wish I had a different brother. Harpreet's brother, he'd be great. But I'm stuck with you, Kendall Mint Cake. So, I'll just have to get on with it, okay? Let's check out the fridge. There were two cardboard boxes, 
One was a big pizza with a smiley face squiggled on the top in tomato sauce. The other was a vast chocolate cake with two layers of buttercream. Mum had pressed pink and purple Smarties on the frosted chocolate icing, spelling out yum yum. I looked at the pizza. I looked at the chocolate cake. I was the one who burst into tears. Kendall watched me warily. Don't you like pizza and chocolate cake? I love them, I said, blowing my nose on the kitchen towel. Why are you crying then? Because mum's tried so hard and I want her too. So that makes me Mr. Mrs. Grizzle Guts, right? You can call me that as much as you like. Grizzle Guts, said Kendall. I let him going on saying it until it was, he was sick of it. It seemed like hours, but then everything seemed to last hours. I heated the pizza and we ate half of it and a big slice of chocolate cake each. I read Thomas the Tank Engine and drew Kendall a train picture, rubbing out again and again until I got all the wheels in a straight line. Then he coloured it in, ruining it. We ate some cold pizza and had another slice of chocolate cake. And another. Well, I did. Kendall just ate the Smarties. It seemed like the whole day had passed, but it was less than an hour. I switched on the telly to check the time because I was sure our clock had stopped. Kendall and I watched for a while, but then there was a hospital programme and I changed channels. We watched some comedy, but we didn't laugh. It was like we were tuned into our own hospital channel, watching our mum being wheeled off to an operating theatre where men in masks attacked her with sharp instruments. Kendall nudged nearer until he was sitting on my lap. I rested my chin on his head. His crew cut was growing out. He looked like a little baby duckling. Your hair's so cute now, Kendall. Kendall stiffened. I want it cut off. No, it's much nicer now. I don't want to look nice. I don't want to look cute. I want to look tough. Dad had always marched him to the barbers for a number one haircut. He didn't look tough. He looked like a bald little baby, but Dad went on about him being a real tough nut. We don't see Dad now, Kendall whispered to George. He turned around to me. We will still see Mum, won't we? Of course we will. Tomorrow, when she comes back from the hospital. Promise? I promise, I said. The voice of doom mocked me. How can you promise that? Maybe she won't ever come back. The voice talked to me half the night. I felt so lonely, even cuddled up to Kendall. I clutched my pinky teddy bear like a sad little toddler. I heard Miss Parker's radio rumbling away underneath me, and then I heard the creak of floorboards above my head and the gurgle of water pipes from Steve or Andy when they went to the loo. Cars went past. Cats yowled. Drunks shouted. Then there were footsteps outside. Every time anyone walked along the pavement, I tensed up. The night went on and on forever. Chapter 16. Home Alone. The mobile rang when Kendall and I were having breakfast. Mum, oh mum, I said, are you okay? Does it hurt? Are you coming home now? I wish, said mum. I haven't had the blooming operation yet. They faffed around yesterday with blood tests and x-rays. They're doing the operation this morning. They're not letting me have any breakfast and I'm starving. So, so when will you be back? I said, all my relief draining away. Well, that's the problem, sweetheart. This nurse says I won't come round from the anaesthetic for hours. And even then, I'll be so groggy I won't be able to put one foot in front of the other. They'll have to change the dressings and there might be a drain too. What's a drain? I don't know. Look, darling, I can't go into all the ins and outs of it. I've borrowed the mobile from the lady in the bed next to me, seeing as you've got mine, so I'll have to be quick. Let me say hello to Kendall. I handed the phone over to him. Mum was obviously asking him questions because he kept nodding. Say something, Kendall. Mum can't see you, I said. Hello, Mum, said Kendall. Mum, can I go and see the real George again? Will you take me? And can I have some more toy sharks? And then, if we got some glass, I could have my own aquarium and... Ouch! Stop it, Lola Rose! Give me the phone back! It's my turn to talk to Mum! She doesn't want to listen to you burbling on about your stupid sharks, I said. Mum? You kids, said Mum. Look, Lola Rose, I'll try to give you a ring tomorrow morning, sometime. I'll have to go now. Bye, darling. Be a good girl, eh? The phone went dead. You hurt me when you pushed me, Kendall said, rubbing his chest. I think you've given me cancer now. Shut up, Kendall. You're so mean to me. Everyone's mean to me, Kendall whined. Mum's mean. She said she'd be back today and I need her. I need her too, I said. Now stop complaining, finish your cornflakes and get ready for school. I was glad to get there. It made everything seem more normal. I didn't want to discuss Mum with Harpreet. Luckily, we had a sex education lesson and we didn't discuss anything else all day. We watched a film where you actually saw this family undressed, totally naked. The whole class got the giggles, especially at the dad. The teacher got a bit narked and said she was disappointed in us for behaving so immaturely. She said there was nothing funny about human bodies. I think they're hilarious, Harpreet whispered. That dad's willy. Yuck. Imagine him just walking around like that. It's disgusting. And the mum was just as bad showing off her boobies. 
I've never seen my mum and dad bare. I did walk in on my brother once in the bathroom and he got really, really mad at me. What's your brother look like then, Harpreet? Harpreet went into a real peal of giggles and when she found a banana in her lunchbox at break, we laughed so much we nearly wet ourselves. I wanted to keep on and on laughing. I whispered to Harpreet all afternoon. I got told off twice and ended up being sent to Miss Balsam. I thought I was going to get told off big time now. I didn't really care. I thought I might argue back, even throw a tantrum like Kendall. But Miss Balsam simply sat me down and offered me a chocolate. I shook my head, although they were posh chocolates in a big gift box. Go on, help me out. I'm supposed to be on a diet, but they're so tempting. You eat a couple for me, there's a good girl. I helped myself to a milk, milk chocolate truffle. Everyone keeps telling me to be a good girl, I said, with my mouth full. I take it you've been behaving like a bad girl today, said Miss Balsam. She picked out a dark chocolate cherry. Just to keep you company, she said, popping it into her mouth. She rattled the box at me and I chose a raspberry cream, white chocolate with a little raised tip of pink. It looked like a tiny doll's breast. I wondered what I was doing, stuffing my face with chocolate when my mum was in hospital. The sticky chocolate stuck to my teeth. My stomach lurched. I clapped my hand to my mouth. In here, quickly, said Miss Balsam, leaping up. She steered me rapidly across the room. She opened a door and I was sick into her private toilet. Miss Balsam tucked my hair behind my ears and held my forehead. There, there, she murmured. When I was done, she wiped my face with her own flannel and gave me a glass of water to sip. Bit of a waste of my chocolate, she said. Still, you did it very neatly. Well done. I giggled weakly. So what's the problem, Lola Rose? Miss Balsam sat on the edge of her desk, looking at me. I suppose I've got a tummy bug, I said. Hmm, said Miss Balsam. There's certainly something bugging you. You're not still hanging around with Ross and his little gang, are you? No, I can't stick them now. What about Peter? He's a good lad at heart. If you fancy a friend, he'd maybe fit the bill. I don't want a boyfriend. I'm happy with Harpreet. Yes, I like Harpreet too. Lovely girl. You're both lovely girls, but I gather you've been very giggly girls today. Giggling about sex, is that right? Sort of. Well, it can seem a bit funny at times, but let's hope you're over the giggles now. I should pop back to your classroom and apologise nicely. Unless you think you might be sick again, maybe I should send you home to mum. I bit my lip. No, I'm fine, I said, getting up quickly. Miss Balsam put her hand on my shoulder. Mum's okay, isn't she, Lola Rose? The walls closed in. The floor wavered. I wanted to clutch Miss Balsam and weep against her chest. But I remembered what Mum had said. Don't let her worm anything out of you and else you'll be put into care. Mum's fine, I said, shrugging my shoulder away. I went back to class and said sorry and sat meekly for the rest of lessons, head down, keeping out of trouble. Harpreet and I had a giggle again on the way home. I kept whispering worse and worse things to set her off. I hated saying goodbye to her when we got to Gabri's house. Then it was just Kendall and me. Tell me, something to make me laugh, Kendall, I said. Go on, tell us a joke. I know an elephant joke. Well, I think I do, said Kendall. He didn't. His joke went on for ages and then he forgot the punchline. Okay, I'll tell you a joke, I said. I don't think I like jokes, said Kendall. Yes, you do. I'll tell you one you'll like. What's yellow and dangerous? Kendall peered at me, his face screwed up anxiously. What's yellow and dangerous? I repeated. Kendall gave a high-pitched laugh. Why are you laughing? Because it's a funny joke. I haven't told it yet. Think, Kendall, what's yellow and dangerous? The voice of doom suddenly spoke, right behind my eyes, making them blink. If he guesses the right answer, your mother will be all right. I shook my head to try to shake myself free of it. Kendall shook his head too, copying me. His head looked as if it might snap straight off his little stork neck. Don't, Kendall. I grabbed his head and held it still. Now listen, this is such an easy-peasy joke. I'm sure you've heard it heaps of times before. What's yellow and dangerous? I saw Kendall mouth yellow and dangerous. He was trying. I knew he was. I'll give you a clue, shall I? George would like this joke. No, he wouldn't. George doesn't like jokes either, said Kendall. He'd like this one because it's about him. And you'll like it because it's about a yummy pudding, the old-fashioned sort that grands make. I wish we had a gran, said Kendall. Then she could look after us. Why haven't we got a gran? She died. Did she get run over? No, she died of... I couldn't say the word. The voice of doom started up again. Think about the joke, Kendall, I said, gripping him by the shoulders. I knew I was being ridiculous. It didn't make any difference whether Kendall knew the stupid joke or not. But I couldn't help myself. I went on saying it over and over again until Kendall cried. It's shark-infested custard, I screamed at last. I had a mad vision of mum struggling in thick yellow custard, surrounded by sharks. I tried to argue with the voice. Mum's going to be all right, I said inside my head. 
She had the operation this morning and now she's right as rain and she'll come back home as soon as she can. She might even be home already, lying on her bed, waiting to give us a big surprise. I knew there wasn't much chance, but I couldn't help hoping. I ran down the road, Kendall trailing after me. The voice of doom changed tack, telling me if I could get indoors before it counted 100, that mum could really be there. I got in the front door just as it reached 90. Mum wasn't there. I ran into every room calling. Kendall stood just inside the front door, nibbling at his thumb. Mum isn't coming back, is she? He said. Yes, she is. As soon as she can. She'll phone us any minute now, because she'll know we're home from school. I put the mobile on the table. We looked and looked and looked at it. I expect she's having her tea, I said. We'll have our tea, shall we? I opened the last tin of baked beans and made some toast. The bread had gone a little mouldy, but I picked off the blue bits. I needn't have bothered. Kendall just fiddled about with his beans, spearing them on his fork one at a time, licking them and then lining them up on his plate. He didn't even touch his toast. For once in my life, I didn't feel like eating either. I could barely swallow my cup of tea. I kept watching the mobile. The battery was getting low. I didn't know if you could still take calls while it was recharging. I stared until my eyes watered. Why wasn't she phoning? She knew we were waiting. She knew we were worried. Maybe the woman in the next bed wouldn't let her use her mobile. Then I had a brilliant idea. I looked in the call register of the phone and found the number. Then I dialed it. I had to give it several goes because my hands were trembling. Hello? I took a deep breath. Hello. Look, you don't know me. I'm Lola Rose, the daughter of the lady in the bed next to you. Oh, please, can I speak to her? Sorry? I wondered if I'd got the wrong number. I'm Victoria Luck's daughter. She's in hospital with you. Oh, right. I'm sorry, dear. I didn't quite get you at first. What's the matter? I want to speak to my mum. Well, darling, I can't help you. Oh, please, just for a minute. Couldn't you pass the phone over? But I'm not in the hospital. I came home this morning. Oh, but, but my mum hasn't come home. What's happened to her? She'll be fine, dear, I'm sure. She was only having her, her op this morning. She said she'd come home. No, pet, not today. She won't be up to it. But is she all right? The operation went okay. She is better now. I don't know, dear. She hadn't even gone up to theatre when I left. Look, get your dad or grandma to ring the hospital. They'll know. Right. Yes, well, thank you, I said. And I touched the end call button. Kendall was looking at me, biting hard at his thumb. She's fine. I'm sure she is, I said. I cleared my throat, sank my head down into my shoulders and spoke from right inside my chest. Do I sound old, Kendall? I growled. Are you being a monster? Kendall asked anxiously. I'm trying to sound like a grown-up, I said. I practiced my voice, ringing directory inquiries. I wrote the hospital number on the back of my hand and then rang. A lady at the other end said the name of the hospital. Can I speak to Victoria Luck, please? I said. I spoke so deep down in my chest that I had to repeat myself twice before she understood. Which ward is she on? I, I don't know which ward. I didn't want to say the word, but I didn't have any choice. It's the cancer ward. It'll probably be Florence. I'll put you through. I breathed out, my hand over my pounding heart. After a long time, someone answered that on Florence ward. Can I speak to Victoria Luck? I asked, my throat hurting. Who's speaking, please? I didn't know what to say. Her mother? Her sister? Her friend? It was the wrong decision. Well, I'm sorry. I'm afraid it's not possible. But I'm grown up, honestly. I'm afraid we don't use the ward phones for friends. Can't you just tell me if she's all right? Please, I suggest you contact Mrs Luck's husband and ask him, she said. Well, you can suggest all you like, Miss snot Nose meanie pants but Dad doesn't know and I wouldn't ring him even if he did, I shouted and then switched the mobile off. Kendall blinked at me. I wondered if I could catch, coach him till he sounded like Dad. I knew it was hopeless. I tried to think of all the possibilities. I could go upstairs and ask Andy to ring for me, though Andy and Steve weren't speaking to us. And if they knew Kendall and I were on our own, they'd maybe tell someone. I could try to find Jake, but I didn't know where he was living now. I could go along the road and ask Harpreet's dad to ring for me. He'd help, but Harpreet's mum would definitely report us. I don't know what to do, I wailed. I slumped on the floor, my head on my knees. I could feel my blood beating, even tickling in my eyelids. Mum, mum. Mum, mum, are you crying? Kendall whispered. I didn't answer. I kept my face hidden. I could hear Kendall breathing noisily above me. He nudged me with his shoe. Lola Rose? I didn't feel like Lola Rose. I didn't even feel like Janie. I was withering away into no one. I wanted mum so badly, I had to bite my lips to stop myself calling for her. What if she wasn't all right? What if the operation had gone wrong? What if she died? You are crying, said Kendall. I'm not. I just need to know if mum's all right. Let's go and find her then, said Kendall. I thought about it. Mum had said we mustn't, but we had to know. 
We couldn't just wait day after day. Chapter 17. Hospital. OK, we'll go to the hospital, I said. We'll find Mum and see how she is. I wiped my eyes, stuffed Kendall into his jacket, tucked George under his arm, and then we set off. I didn't even have enough money for a minicab, so we went to the bus stop. I asked the driver how to get to the hospital. He said he didn't have a clue. It wasn't on his route. But an old woman sitting at the front said she'd been sent to the eye clinic there and we needed to get out at the flyover and change to a number 88. She made me sit down beside her and pull Kendall right onto her lap. He fidgeted tensely. She clasped him tightly around the tummy. He can't stand his tummy being touched. I hoped he wasn't going to make a fuss. She was trying to be kind, but she kept asking nosy questions. I made up this whole story about visiting our sick granny, our mum meeting us at the hospital. Kendall frowned. Keep still, Mr Fidget Bottom, said the old lady. Kendall slumped sideways, whispering to George. The bus ride lasted forever, but we got to the flyover at last. The old lady waved to both of us. I waved back, trying to look grateful, but Kendall ducked his head. I didn't like her, he said. I could feel her knicker elastic through her skirt. Yuck, he shuddered. She's not our gran, is she? Of course not. We haven't got a gran. But you said we had, Kendall sighed. You keep telling stories. I can't remember who we've got and who we haven't. We haven't got anyone except you and me and mum, and we're going to see mum now. It will be a lovely surprise for her. Is that true, or is that another story? It's true, as true as true, I said over and over. I chanted it on the 88 bus all the way to the hospital. It was a huge place. It took us ages even to find our way across the car park. A man at the entrance told us we couldn't come in without an adult. I said quick as a wink. We were with our dad, but he was still trying to find someone to park. He'd sent us ahead to buy our mum some flowers from the gift shop. The man nodded and let us in. But he watched as we squeaked along the polished floor in our trainers. We'll really buy mum some flowers, I said. How did you know to come out of all that stuff, Kendall hissed. I'm just inventive, I suppose. My inventions meant we spent nearly all our money on a bunch of flowers that already looked a bit droopy. I told Kendall it was the thought that counted. We got in a lift, having to squash up against the wall because a lady in a bed on wheels was already inside. She looked very ill. Every time the lift jerked, she groaned. Kendall slipped his hand into mine. The nurse pushing the bed gave us a smile. Where are you off to, kids? She asked. We're going to see our mum. Where's dad? He's up there already, I said. I seemed to be inventing multiple dads in the car park, in the ward. I had it all worked out in my head that dad could also be in the gents' toilet or feeding our baby sister or held up talking to a neighbour on another ward. I was all set to lie until my tongue turned black, but I didn't have to say a thing when we got to Florence Ward. There were two nurses sharing a bunch of grapes in a little side room, but they didn't spot us. We hurried past bed after bed, looking for mum. Some of the women were lying down, looking grey like the lady in the lift. Some were sitting, chatting to their visitors, eating chocolates and opening cards. Some were shuffling up and down the ward in their dressing gowns, attached to weird pull-along drips. What are those bag things for? Kendall asked. It's to make them better. Mum won't have one, will she? I don't think so. Where is mum? She'll be just up here, I said hoarsely. The voice of doom was shouting in my head. I saw an empty bed, stripped of, it, stripped of its covers. I stopped still, staring at it. Ouch! Your nails are digging in, Kendall said. Then he pulled away from me. Mum? He went charging down to the end of the ward. I blundered after him, looking around wildly. Then I saw her too, her blonde hair fanned out on her pillow. She had her head turned to the wall, so we couldn't see her face. The bedclothes were right up over her shoulders. She was lying very still. Mum, said Kendall. She's asleep, I said. I put my hand on Mum's shoulder and shook her gently. Mum! She mumbled something and tried to pull the covers up over her head. Mum, it's us, Lola Rose and Kendall. Mum opened her eyes. She looked at us blearily. I wondered if she'd forgotten our new names. I bent right up close so that my lips were against her ear. It's Janie and Kenny, Mum. I whispered. Hello, she said. She didn't sound particularly pleased to see us. How are you, Mum? I asked. Bloody terrible, she said. She sounded as if she had the worst hangover in the world, but she still sounded like herself. She wasn't lying back all grey and groaning, though she did groan when Kendall nuzzled up to her for a cuddle. Mind out, it's sore. Kendall froze. Have they chopped your booby right off, Mum? He asked. Christ, I hope not, said Mum, scrabbling under the covers. No, I'm all here under the bandages. They've hacked at it. They've hacked under my arm, too. He's a bloody butcher, that Mr. Key. But it's to make you better, Mum. You are better now, aren't you? I said. I don't know. I don't care. I just want to go to sleep. She tried to burrow back down. I tapped her shoulder. So will you come home tomorrow, Mum? 
Look, I'll try, but at the moment I can't even get up to go to the loo, let alone get myself all the way home. But, but what are we going to do, Mum? We haven't got any money left. We spent the last of it on your flowers. I laid them on the pillow beside her. Mum looked at them. That was a bit stupid then. Look, they're wilting already. I swallowed hard. I'm sorry, Mum, but what are we going to do? Mum's eyes were closing. Look, ask your dad, she murmured. Dad? Mum, wake up. We don't live with Dad anymore, remember? Mum moaned. Oh, God, she said. She started crying. She didn't make any noise, but tears leaked out of her closed eyelids. Kendall started crying too. His mouth puckered. I was scared someone might call a nurse. Don't cry, Mum, I said. My throat was so tight it hurt to talk. It's okay. It's not okay. Oh, God, I'm so useless. Maybe you kids would be better off in care than stuck with me. No, we wouldn't. You're a lovely mum. You can't help being sick. Don't you cry now. We'll manage. I'll think of something. Mum's face contorted. What is it, mum? Is it the pain? I can't stand it when you're so bloody brave, mum sobbed. I'm sorry, kids. I've screwed everything up. No, you haven't. You're the best mum in the whole world, and we're going to get better ever so quick, and we'll stay lucky, lucky, lucky. I went on talking to her like she was my little girl, stroking her soft hair. She sighed, snuggled down, and went to sleep. I stood still, feeling her shoulders rise at each breath. I told myself that I didn't care about anything else, just so long as she was alive. Kendall snuffled behind me. He had one hand between his legs and a desperate expression. I didn't get him to the loo in time. My trousers are all wet, Kendall wailed. Never mind. It's getting dark outside. No one will notice. Are we going home now? That's right. I gave him a big smile. I was Lola Rose. I'd get us home somehow, even though we didn't have any money. We waited for the first bus and got on. I opened my purse and then looked astonished to find it empty. I gave a little gasp and told the bus driver that my mum had given me two pounds for the bus journey, and now they weren't there. Spent it on sweets, have you? he said. But then he grinned. Go on, kids, hop on. The second bus driver wasn't anywhere near as kind. He said we'd have to fill out a special form with our name and address. I got very worried, but a lady with a lot of shopping standing behind us said, Oh, for God's sake, I'll pay for them. And she did. We both said thank you very much. She gave us a little lecture about being out late by ourselves. And didn't our mother know? Our mum's in hospital, said Kendall. She looked at his tear-stained face. Oh dear, I'm so sorry, she said. So, we got all the way home for nothing. It was very late when we got back. Kendall was starving hungry, and so was I. I looked at the last few slices of bread in the packet, but they were bluer than ever, and smelt funny. Kendall opened his mouth, hopefully, like a little bird. No, it's gone bad. You'll get a tummy ache if you eat it. I want to eat something, said Kendall. I fought hard. Wait here. I went downstairs and knocked on Miss Parker's door. Her television was blaring, but she didn't answer. I tried calling through her letterbox. There's nobody in, she called, which was a pretty daft thing to do. Still, she was daft, so what did I expect? She wouldn't come to her door. I gave up on her and went upstairs to Steve and Andy's. I felt sick with nerves. Mum had called Steve and Andy a lot of bad names. Maybe they'd yell rude things at me when they saw who was knocking. I prayed it would be Andy who came to the door. He was so much nicer than Steve. It was Steve. He raised his eyebrows when he saw me. He didn't say anything at all, just folded his arms. I'm sorry to bother you, Steve, I said. You don't bother me, though I seem to bother you, judging by all the names I get called. I didn't ever call you names. No, but your mum certainly came out with a mouthful. I know. I'm sorry. She's sorry too. She was just upset because of that Jake. I haven't seen him around recently. He's gone. Oh dear. He didn't sound very sympathetic. I bet your mum's in a bit of a state. Yes, she is. So, she didn't get to the shops today, and I wonder, I know it's a bit of a cheek, but could we borrow a carton of milk? Steve's eyebrows shot up further. So, she sent you on this little begging mission. She's not feeling very well. Hmm, said Steve. Who is it, Steve? Andy called from inside their flat. It's little Lola Lollipop from downstairs, said Steve. Come to beg a pint of milk off us. Borrow, I said. We'll, we'll pay you back when, whenever. Hi, Lola Rose, said Andy, gently pushing Steve to one side. You okay, sweetheart? Yes, I'm fine. Andy still looked concerned. Come in for a minute, he said. Would you like a cup of tea, a Coke and crisps? My mouth watered at the fort. I can't really leave Kendall, I said. Isn't your mum home, said Steve, narrowing his eyes. Yes, yes, but she's in bed. Not very well. I want to make her a cup of tea, see, so if I could just borrow that milk. Sure, said Andy. He brought me a big two-pint carton, plus a couple of cans of Coke and a big bag of kettle crisps. Take these back for you and Kendall. Oh, thank you. Andy, thank you. What about breakfast? Has mum got something in? Well, the bread's gone a bit stale. 
He gave me half their loaf and a big packet of muesli. You're so kind. Yeah, he's Mr. Soft Touch, said Steve, but he didn't sound too cross about it. Kendall and I devoured the Coke and crisps. I felt we should save half as it was such a big bag, but we were so hungry we ended up munching every scrap and licking out the bag. Kendall drank his Coke too quickly and got the hiccups. He found that uproariously funny at first, and then he got tired and tetchy. Stop me, he begged. I tried making him sip water, but he hiccuped in mid-swallow and choked. Even that, that didn't stop him. I knew you were supposed to be able to frighten someone out of hiccups, so I tried creeping up on him and going boo, and this didn't work either. It seemed so stupid trying to frighten him when we were in such a scary situation already. The voice of doom was laughing its head off. Chapter 18. Auntie Barbara. Kendall was still hiccuping when I put him to bed. I made him lie on his tummy and then I patted his back. I used to do this when you were a little baby, I said. It always made you burp. Me a little baby now, Kendall lisped. Burpy, burpy, burp. He made George jump up and down. Poor George, he's got the burpy hiccups too. I'm not surprised he's got hiccups. Tell him to stop snacking on poor little Bobby Blue Bear. He gets hungry, said Kendall, and Bobby likes being eaten. Well, tell George he better not start on Pinky. I don't want shark slobber all over my bear. Kendall giggled, hiccuped one last time and fell fast asleep. I took my clothes off and lay down beside him. I'd put Kendall to sleep. I'd put Mum to sleep. I wanted someone to come along and put me to sleep. There were too many worries circling around and round my head. I knew Mum couldn't come home tomorrow, maybe not even the day after, and when she did come home she'd probably still feel poorly. She wouldn't be able to work for a while, so what were we going to do for money? I couldn't keep begging food from Steve and Andy. I couldn't think of any way I could earn money myself. You had to be 13 before you could do a newspaper round. I'd seen a few kids helping out in the market, but they were all boys. I could filch a few bruised bananas and rotten apples as the market closed up each day, but that wouldn't be enough to feed the three of us. I could hang about outside McDonald's and grab leftover french fries and half-eaten burgers. I could sidle round Sainsbury's and pinch a packet here, a tin there. No, I couldn't. I didn't have the bottle. What if I got caught? It was wrong to steal, but Mum needed good food to build her strength up. She'd look so little lying there in hospital. What if I had to watch her losing weight day after day? What if she died? What would Kendall and I do then? Would they make us go back to Dad? He'd be kind to Kendall, but I wasn't this little Janie anymore. I was big enough for him to batter. I moved my jaw gingerly. It still sometimes ached from that one punch. I couldn't take it like Mum. I was a terrible baby. I'd cry, and that always made Dad madder. I curled up small and felt for Pinky Bear. I hugged her hard against my chest. I thought of Dad's fists. Tears trickled onto Pinky's fur. I wished she could grow bigger, big as my pillow, big as the bed. I wanted her to lift me up and cradle me against her pink fur. Auntie Barbara had given her to me when I was born. Maybe Auntie Barbara looked like a giant Pinky without her clothes. I clutched Pinky tight. Auntie Barbara. I couldn't remember her properly. I last saw her at Grandma's funeral when I was younger than Kendall. Mum talked about her size so much, she seemed like a character in a cartoon. It was weird remembering she was real. Would she help us? I knew Grandad would have nothing to do with us, but maybe Auntie Barbara was softer. She must like us a little bit if she sent us special teddies. She used to send books too, before we moved to the flats. I remembered a big book about an elephant, and one about a little bear, and a funny one about jelly with a hole in the pages. I'd loved those pictures, those picture books, but Kendall tore them all up when he was a toddler. Auntie Barbara hadn't sent us any presents for years, but maybe she simply didn't have our address. I didn't have her address. I couldn't ask Mum. She'd go mad if she thought I was going begging to the sister she couldn't stand. I wondered why Mum didn't like her. Maybe Auntie Barbara had been really mean to her, but she wasn't just Mum's sister. She was my auntie. Aunties were meant to help you, weren't they? Harpreet had heaps of aunties. They made a big fuss of her, invited her to tea, and bought her special sweets and hair slides and bangles. Maybe my Auntie Barbara wouldn't mind if I asked her to send a few fivers to tide us over until Mum could work. She must have quite a lot of money if she lived in Grandad's pub. I couldn't remember the name. It was some sort of fish. The cod? No, that sounded stupid. The salmon? That wasn't right either. The trout? That was it, and I knew the town even if I didn't know the street. I sat up in bed and rang directory inquiries on Mum's mobile. I wrote the number down and then dialed it quickly before I could change my mind. The phone rang and rang. I hoped Grandad wouldn't come to the phone. I was about to give up, but then someone answered. A woman. The trout. Can I help you? Though it's after closing time. I'm sorry, I forgot it was so late. Can I speak to Barbara, please? Speaking. Oh, well, you don't really know me, but, but I think you're my auntie. 
Oh, good Lord. Is that Janie? Yes. Oh, Janie, how lovely that you phoned. You don't mind? Of course not. I've been hoping and hoping you would all get in touch. What's happened, Janie? Are you all right? Well, sort of. It's just... I didn't know where to start. Let me have a word with your mum, said Auntie Barbara. Well, that's just it. She's not here. Where is she? In hospital. Oh, God, did your dad catch her then? I sat up in bed, startled. How did Auntie Barbara know we'd run away? No, she's had to go to hospital to have a lump taken out. She said she'd come straight back, but she didn't. So we went to see her and she's all sleepy, but I, I think she's all right. We're back home now, Kenny and me, but we haven't got any money left. I don't know what we're going to do for food. We've got some muesli, but I don't think Kenny will eat it. The bread's gone mouldy, so I was wondering if you could send us some money, Auntie Barbara, just for a few days. We'll pay you back the minute Mum gets work. She doesn't know I'm phoning, and I'll be ever so grateful if you don't tell Grandad, because I know he doesn't like us. But I thought you might just be kind enough to... Janie, let me get a word in edgeways. Sweetheart, now calm down. I'm going to help, don't worry. Hang on while I get a pen and paper. Then you can give me your address. Oh, Auntie Barbara, I said, and I burst into tears. She sounded so nice. I cried so hard, I could barely stammer out the address. Auntie Barbara repeated it back to me to make sure she'd got it right. There now, Janie. Don't cry, pet. It's going to be all right. You can count on me. Now, have you got the door locked, you and Kenny? Then I should try to go to sleep now. Don't worry any more. I'll get everything sorted out. You'll see. So I went to sleep, clutching Pinky to my chest, Kendall breathing softly by my side. And then Kendall woke me up, shaking my shoulder and tugging my hair. Leave off, Kendall. There's someone knocking at the door, Lola Rose. It's the middle of the night. What? It'll be someone for Steve and Andy. One of their mates will have been at a party. They're calling out for Janie and Kenny, Kendall paused. Is that still us? Oh, help. I flew to the window, thinking it was Dad. I saw a very large woman peering up at me in the moonlight, clutching great carrier bags. Auntie Barbara. I ran down the stairs, tripping and nearly falling in my eagerness. Miss Parker poked her head around the door. She had a hairnet pulled right down to her eyebrows. I'm telling the housing people on you, she said, waking a body at all hours. It's disgraceful. I'm sorry, really sorry, but it's my auntie, I said, hurrying towards the front door. I don't care if it's little green men from Mars. They shouldn't come knocking on the middle of the night, said Miss Parker. I took no notice, fiddling with the bolts on the door. Don't go, Auntie Barbara. I'm coming, I called. I got the door open at last. Auntie Barbara dropped the bags and held out her arms to me. I fell against her. Whenever I hugged Mum hard, she always teetered on her heels and said, Careful, you'll knock me over. No one could knock Auntie Barbara over. She didn't budge an inch. She stayed still like a well-upholstered sofa while I leaned against her and cried on the big soft cushion of her chest. A small fist pummeled at my bottom. Do we know her? Kendall asked. I stopped snivelling and stepped back, reaching for Kendall. Of course we do. This is our auntie, Auntie Barbara. This is Kenny. I'm Kendall, he said. Auntie Barbara stooped. Arms open. Kendall backed rapidly. I don't hug strange ladies, he said. Kendall, I hissed. Auntie Barbara laughed. Quite right, Kendall. And they don't come any stranger than me. She did look strange. She had long blonde hair, thick and soft, like mum's. But Auntie Barbara's was really long. She wore it caught up and coiled and twisted into a bun at the top of her head, though little tendrils escaped and hung down like earrings. She had a very pretty face with mum's big blue eyes. She didn't wear any makeup. Her skin was very pink, as if she spent a lot of time scrubbing it. If you chopped Auntie Barbara off at the neckline, one of those old hair-styling doll heads, she'd win any beauty contest. But things started to go weird past her shoulders. There was just so much of her. She was the biggest lady I'd ever seen. She wasn't just fat. She was vast. So massive, she seemed a different species altogether. She wasn't a wibbly-wobbly like the lovely maid at the hotel. She looked like she was made of pink marble, a great monument. She was wearing a vast silk top in a wonderful deep purple with a matching wrap-around skirt. It could have wrapped around Kendall a mere dozen times. Her toenails were painted purple too, shining in her silver sandals. I wondered at first how she could stretch down over her huge stomach to reach her toes, but she proved amazingly agile for such a large lady. She bounded up the stairs to our flat, swinging the great bags. Miss Parker watched, open-mouthed. Who's she when she's at home? The Queen of, the Queen of Sheba? Auntie Barbara laughed and gave her a regal wave. She had a great silver ring on either hand and a huge chunk of amber hung on a, a thick silver chain. It was easy enough to imagine an amber crown on top of her coiled hair. Kendall and I followed in her wake. Her bottom was enormous above us. Kendall's eyes met mine. We struggled not to giggle. Steve and Andy peered down from their landing above in little shorty Japanese dressing gowns. 
Auntie Barbara waved to them too. When we got inside our front door, Auntie Barbara said, I wonder if they realised we could see right up their dressing gowns. We could all giggle together. Right, Janey, where's the kettle? I'm dying for a cup of tea and biscuits. I'm afraid we haven't got any. I have, said Auntie Barbara. She opened one of the carriers and brought out tea bags, chocolate hobnobs, a walnut cake, fairy cakes, donuts, a multi-pack of sandwiches, bananas, apples, and a giant bar of Cadbury's chocolate. I think we could all do with a bit of sustenance, she said, smiling. I went to the all-night supermarket on the way. How did you know that I like chocolate, Auntie Barbara? I asked her, awed. I like it, said Auntie Barbara. I've been known to eat a whole bar by myself. Not a giant bar. Oh, you bet a giant bar, said Auntie Barbara, bustling around making tea as if she'd lived in our flat all her life. But aren't you worried that, that it'll make me fat, said Auntie Barbara, and she hooted with laughter. <laughs> Bit late in the day to start worrying. She sat herself down on Mum's sofa bed, filling it as if it were her own armchair. Kendall and I sat cross-legged in front of her. We had cups of tea too and started on Auntie Barbara's picnic. It tasted wonderful. Even Kendall ate heaps properly too, swallowing the crusts on his sandwiches and eating the sponge as well as the icing on his fairy cake. Auntie Barbara ate the most, mo the most though. It was plain, plain she could eat out anyone. She saw me watching every mouthful she took. I'm a very bad example, Janie, she said. It's very unhealthy to eat as much as me and get so terribly fat. Then why do you do it? Kendall asked. Don't be so rude, Kendall, I said, nudging him. No, it's a perfectly sensible question. Shame is, haven't got any answers. I eat because I'm greedy. I like food. I like food too, I said, biting my lip. Don't look so worried. I'm sure you won't take after me, said Auntie Barbara, happily biting into a big eclair, cream oozing everywhere. I don't take after mum, I said, reaching for an eclair too. I don't think you need take after anyone. You're yourself, unique, the one and only Janie. She's not Janie, said Kendall. Auntie Barbara wiped the cream from her mouth. Who is she then, Kenny? Whoops, sorry, Kendall. I call myself Lola Rose now, I said shyly, and Kenny's Kendall, like he said, a mum's Victoria Luck. Auntie Barbara nodded. Are these new names to stop your dad tracking you down? How do you know? Because he came barging into my pub weeks ago, effing and blinding and generally doing his nut. He said your mum's gone off with a footballer. Has she? No, she stopped seeing him ages and ages ago. No, we had to do a runner because my dad hit my mum. And then he went for me. My dad didn't hit me. My dad said I'm his little champ, Kendall said, sticking his chin up. He's the big champ and I'm the little champ. Little chump, more like, I said. You shut up, Lola Rose, said Kendall, clenching his fist. I think Lola Rose is an absolutely lovely name, said Auntie Barbara. Did your mum think that up? I chose it myself, I said proudly. You won't tell dad, will you, Auntie Barbara? What do you think I am, daft, said Auntie Barbara. Had a few sharp words with him. He didn't hit you, did he? I'd like to see him try, said Auntie Barbara, flexing her big arms. I don't think any man would dare take me on. Even your granddad thought better of it once I'd got to a certain age. He had a really nasty temper too, just like your dad. He didn't mellow in old age either. He was a crabby old beggar up until the day he died. In fact, he died in mid-rant, yelling at me because I was changing the beer barrels. So, he's dead. Our granddad. A couple of years ago. I tried to let your mum know, but she's moved. She isn't a girl for keeping in touch. We didn't really get on when we were kids, your mum and me. We were so different, chalk and cheese. We had this awful row over something, and I got really mad at your mum. But that was long ago. I'm not mad at her now, and I've never been mad at you two. I'm so happy you phoned me, Janie. So sorry, Lola Rose. How did you get here so quick? There aren't any buses this early, are there? I drove, sweetheart. I'll pop back down to the car in a minute and get my case. Your case? I'm staying to look after you, darling, until your mum gets better. I've got it all organised at the pub. I've got this lovely Australian couple working as bar staff. And they're going to manage things for me till I get back. You don't think I'd just lob a few pounds and a packet of biscuits at you and then disappear? I'm your auntie. Your family. And that is where we will leave part six of Lola Rose by Jacqueline Wilson. I'll be back soon with the next part of this fantastic story and lots more stories and videos coming your way very soon. If you'd like to subscribe or hit a like, that's always appreciated. Thanks for listening, guys. Take care. Bye bye.